So this is, all of this is not unique to Africa. Um, these were corroborated by researches carried out by the likes of CiriCos and published in May 2021 um, with the topic COVID-19 and freedom of expression. And here we see that the biggest challenge in all these two cases studies that I've, I've spoken about is the balancing between public health safety and human rights. Amnesty International says attacks on freedom of expression by governments combined with the flood of misinformation across the world during the COVID-19 pandemic have had a devastating impact on people's ability to access accurate and timely information to help them cope with the burgeoning global health crisis. Indeed, press freedom and citizens' engagements were curtailed in some of these countries, as the government of these countries wanted little or no call for transparency. Well, the case of Tanzania and the case of Nigeria, if I, you know, I, I, and, and, you know, and the way if, even the data and information on COVID-19 was being produced and handled, and whether the data truly represents the reality on the ground, we've had several of these cases. There were also grave high-handed mess of many African governments and politicians in disclosing to the citizens how public funds were being allocated and spent on COVID-19. There are lots of stories coming from Nigeria on this. Till date, that remains a major Albert source of many African governments on the issue of COVID-19 funds utilization. These various factors eventually helped to worsen the case of public, poor public trust in the ability of some governments to provide on distorted public health information to their citizens and further drive the huge vaccine hesitancy reported across most, of, most parts of Africa, including my own country, Sierra Leone. So again, to respond to how has this conversation around freedom of expression on free media in Africa has changed as a result of COVID-19, I think we now see that COVID-19 has proven the need for more collaborative, multilateral, and multisexual approach in strengthening public health response and resilience, and public safety for now and for future pandemics. Within the backdrop of trust and transparency and the appropriate balance between public safety and human rights considerations. I must also argue that the enormity of this situation should determine on how much we can leverage one side against the other. WHO actually declared that they, do not only, they are not only fighting COVID-19, but we are also fighting an epidemic which requires some level of information management. In the light of this, there's a strong and growing push for more free and liberalized independent media, including the removal of the criminal libel laws across the continent to act as a check on government and as well as provide a veritable platform for amplifying and protecting the voices of citizens for constructive engagement with their governments. Moreover, there is a need for a stronger civil society role in assuring information quality, pushing the boundaries on transparency and accountability. We have seen the case of budget in Nigeria, which is exemplary. There is also a louder conversation on more purposeful engagement with social media and digital information tech companies to include them in the fight against mis and disinformation. These new en environments, as we all know, demand very specific literacy skills. And I'm a, very, I'm a, I'm a loud advocate, advocate of media information literacy. In order to be fully in control of our online presence and to make the most of the opportunities these new technologies and online platforms have to offer, while also steering clear of the risk. Therefore, I must add, and I must say aloud again in this platform, that Africa needs digital skills education to provide all of us with the skills to detect fake news and what to do if we feel something shared on our social media feeds is not factual. Finally, I must say social media and online media coverage has become especially vital in sharing important news on our COVID-19 response. Media information literacy skills again and use of traditional methods, do not forget in radio, in curtailing misinformation, in offline discussions are also very vital. Here in Sierra Leone, I serve at the National COVID-19 Response as a media lead. We have a platform on Facebook to ensure all public information on COVID-19 are fact-checked and they are proactively helped to address uh, misinformation. We have also had held media hackathons to discuss how we can best serve the media to spread credible information. Um, it's not working, but again, this Friday, we are also meeting with the media owners, editors, and station managers to encourage them to own the response in the sense that they see themselves as an integral part of the response. Thank you, and I can answer any questions later.
Thank you so much, Yema. And indeed, we shall be having um, more conversations um, about um, just what you have uh, talked about, the issues around um, our responses, especially to this pandemic, are issues that we definitely um, are going to be going into in some level of detail uh, a little later in the conversation. Right now, I want to invite Irongo Houghton to um, put on his video. Um, I know that he put on his makeup and he looks great today. Um, my friend Irongo is um, big on the question of accountability. And what we asked him to talk about today um, is to give us some story about what is being done to hold African governments and the private sector um, to account for data abuse, and even to highlight some of the things that need to change based on the experience. Um, and he will just be telling us stories about um, his, his current experience um, uh, around this issue um, for the next 10 minutes. So Irongo, um, if you're there, um, I would be happy to see you. I, I would love to uh, make that possible, but um, somebody will have to uh, empower me to switch on my video because uh, my host has uh, stopped it apparently. Oh, if you, if you, I think if you put on the video, it will work. No, no, I'm clicking and it's uh, giving me a lovely little note that says, the co-host has asked you, here we go, here we go now. Thank you very much. <laughs> So um, thanks, uh, Yema. Uh, hi, everybody, and uh, greetings from the Amnesty family to uh, Open Institute and um, all the colleagues uh, that are here, I guess the digital activists uh, that we are. It's a great pleasure to be um, speaking again at Botswani. Um, this is not my first time, and uh, I'm just thankful to Al, um, to, um, to Jay, to Tom, and um, uh, Ben for keeping this going. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity. We do look forward to also meeting in, in person. So I'm going, to, I'm going to just maybe create a little bit of what's been, um, you know, kind of our little journey on this topic. And, uh, you know, in 2019, uh, 2018, Amnesty was not working on digital rights in any profound way. Um, towards the end of uh, 2018, early 2019, we began to notice that there was tremendous um, interest in the state um, in terms of beginning to um, the Kenyan state, in terms of beginning to think through um, a series of policies, legal amendments, and um, administrative practices that would really generate a lot of um, private data in the hands of the state. Um, and I just very quickly, there was the uh, amendment to the Registrations of Persons Act that opened up, um, you know, uh, registration to biometrics and to DNA and other, um, uh, you know, personally verifiable uh, data. This passed through Parliament very quickly. Um, a few months later, we discovered that there was a CCTV camera policy that sought to uh, require all public spaces to have CCTV cameras and for them to be networked into a grid, um, which would require the owners of these public spaces to make sure that they had compatible equipment uh, to do this. And um, we suddenly began to think something important is happening. But really the big moment, I think, for all Kenyans, and it's a story that's been told many times across the international community, was the Huduma number, the idea of a, a single personal uh, verifiable um, uh, you know, number that could uh, essentially link everybody's data across different government departments, whether it be health insurance issues, whether it be taxation, uh, whether it be um, uh, only a motor vehicle um, or any other interaction with the state. And it was said that this would become the single verifier of truth. This would be your identity as a citizen. And um, we realized that something very big was happening. We then um, uh, watched the national census, of course, like everywhere in the world, it's a 10, 10 year census. And uh, it seemed that all was going well until three days before the census ran. Um, and uh, we saw three additional questions that hadn't been put into the uh, pilot phase of the uh, national census and those excuse me, those three um, indicators um, or other three questions linked about 60 questions, uh, which at that point were all anonymous um, as per the uh, legal uh, framework, as per the Statistics Act. But it linked them to uh, people's um, uh, personally, personal information. So you had to put in a, um, some form of an ID number or a passport. Um, and secondly, which um, was the first time that this had happened, we were now doing the census using tablets and uh, geotagging um, was very, very possible at this point. So they could, the state could have 65 points of data on you, plus know where you live, plus have um, 
access to your identity uh, number uh, within the state. And we realized that something very big was happening. Um, so we got much more involved in this. And I, 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 I'll leave it there for the moment. But I think what I'm present to over COVID is how much data continues to be mined and collected uh, without the knowledge of Kenya. Um, so three, three vignettes, three uh, stories. Patient zero for Kenya was a woman called, is a woman called uh, Brenda. And uh, she was essentially introduced to the nation um, and the very skeptical um, uh, Twitter, Twitterati uh, began to die, uh, dissect her. And before we knew it, they had broken down, you know, everything. They'd got into her uh, Facebook accounts. They'd got into her uh, Instagram. Uh, they were now discussing her sexual life. They were sharing photographs with her. Um, that she had not consented to. Many of them were uh, quite re in, in very revealing um, uh, lingerie. Um, they uh, talked about, you know, it was, you know, they basically discussed her whole medical history um, within probably about 48 hours. And I, you know, I think for many of us, we began to realize that something very dangerous was uh, happening. So uh, despite the Hippocratic oath that says all patient data um, is kept um, Secret, and that's you know been around even before Jesus Christ. Um, we were now able to dissect this woman in front of our eyes on a timeline, right? Um, very soon after that, a member of parliament was um, uh, was revealed to have uh, in a, a very compromising sexual position with um, um, a member of her staff. That went viral again, um, and then we were into the heat of the COVID period where. Um, we were suddenly starting to see data being generated about the rate of infections, um, the location of those uh, uh, infections, and this was being done on a daily basis. Um, we still have the same process like many countries in terms of the rate of vaccinations um, and which particular groups um, are being vaccinated um, at what, uh, at, you know, with what kind of trends. Uh, on Sunday, Saturday, I went into the capital of uh, Nairobi and to the central business district and I left my car and I'd forgotten the um, uh, short code that one uses to pay the parking fees. I uh, went into the restaurant to tell somebody that I was coming back. And as I was just getting to the restaurant, I got a text um, on my phone saying, uh, you've not paid for parking. And this is your number. This is your car license plate. And uh, you need to um, uh, pay. And this is the short code. Um, I was actually quite grateful that the short code was there because I then could pay for parking. But I was really amazed by the speed at which um, my car had been located. Um, it was clear to uh, the officer that um, I had not paid and that they could reach me, right? Um, so I think we now live very consciously in an age where medical data, dietary data, physical location, our relationships, um, our consumer choices, uh, the, um, uh, our taxes, um, and the income that we're making uh, either on houses or uh, renting out houses or even in terms of uh, the vehicles that we own. And um, funny enough for Kenya, uh, the, the choices of parties that we want to be members for, this is all being collected without our consent. Um, and uh, it's not just one or two government departments. We have the Kenya Revenue Authority. We have the Office of the Registrar of Political Parties. Many of, the, uh, many of us, including some of us on this call, found that we are members of parties that we had not consented to. But obviously, somebody had taken our um, uh, our ID numbers and just uploaded them into a, a party database in order to get um, a share of the uh, party revenue that is now given to parties over a particular size. But you know, the National Transport um, uh, NTSA, NTSC, um, the Centre, the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry of Health. So I think we need to really um, be present to how important this is. But I would also want to make one point: is that there is some data that is just not collected. Um, for example, nobody is very seriously interested in how many adverse affections there are, infect, sorry, um, effects there are of the COVID-19 uh, vaccines that are being used. Nobody is collecting that data. Um, and uh, in that sense, one is curious about not just the misuse of data, but actually the, data, the use of data, um, if we are genuinely interested in keeping people safe over this period. So from a Kenyan perspective, I think it's important to recognize Amnesty did a study recently. We um, polled Kenyans on their awareness. And one of the things that was interesting was less than 5%, sorry, less than 5 out of 10 Kenyans, so about 50% of Kenyans, um, uh, uh, felt, that, you know, felt that they understood the right to personal um, uh, data and, and to privacy. 
Um, four out of 10 were familiar with the new uh, Data Protection Act that was passed in 2019 after several of us called for its um, enactment. Um, and uh, very few um, people actually know how to report a data breach. So I'm gonna to turn to your last question because I think this is, is probably the crux of this um, discussion, which is, you know, what are the things that um, we can do? And I think there is a couple of very broad uh, comments. The first is regulation matters, regulation matters, regulation matters. We have to push for um, governments to regulate um, and protect us from the misuse of our own data. We must also push governments to use data that we have consented to, um, to inform public policy. And, uh, and this is critical. There's no human rights impact that we will see without a um, data-driven evidence-based policymaking process. Um, I think the second thing that um, we uh, need to think about is how do we build rights awareness uh, among the population? Um, you know, Kenya is rife with identity theft, whether it be financial identity, our financial identities, our personal information, our medical information, or um, even the uh, use of um, our data to our identities to commit crimes um, and, and get away with them. So I think this is one area that we need to focus on. And I think it's really important also to see um, that, you know, to, to link this to the lack of safety for many people on the internet, um, uh, you know, particularly for women, particularly for people um, who are, uh, come from sexual minorities. This is the first thing, the first place that um, you know, th these communities um, will have their freedom of expression uh, silenced. It's the first place um, that activists will be targeted and it's the first place that women will be shamed off the internet um, by either using their pri private information or simply making up stuff and dis disinforming everybody. So I think this is, um, this is important. I think rather than heavy uh, legislative censorship, what I think we need to see is proactive um, human rights education that actually drowns out the darkness, that drowns out the trolling and uh, the abuse and the intimidation. I think the third thing that I wanted to say is that um, there is still too many of us, middle ground people, who may not be using other people's data. They may not be um, body shaming. They may not be trolling. They may not be using abusive, but they do have this sense um, that actually what's the problem with our data being available. If you're a person with integrity, if you're not a criminal, if you're not doing anything that is um, that you need to hide, why should you worry? And I think, you know, the Open Institutes campaign recently was a great campaign. And what they said was, listen, you know, you, um, you know, you may not, um, uh, you know, be, be worried about what you look like without any clothes on, but heaven's sake, may, very few of us actually walk around without any clothes on. Um, there is something about, you know, essentially protecting um, information um, uh, that is personal and private that is so critical at this point. And therefore, um, please don't walk naked uh, on the internet. You wouldn't do it in personal life. Um, and then lastly, I think it's just a very practical thing that has been really interesting in the Kenyan context is, you know, our law, the Data Protection Act, um, provides for a impact assessment um, of any agency or um, I think it's, it's any agencies, whether it's corporate, uh, private sector or public, uh, that before they can collect data on you, they have to do an impact assessment to look at what would be the risks. And sadly, you know, the government, um, the executive um, has, has seen, um, you know, a, a very major defeat in court led by an organization called Katiba Institute, where they failed to do the impact assessment. And for some of us on this call, um, it, it, was, it was sad that uh, the, it had to get to this because um, 10 months ago, we actually were in a round table with um, members of um, uh, the government and the um, public interest litigator uh, organization, uh, Katiba Institute. And, and we had reached an agreement that they would rectify um, this part of it and that they would actually do um, the uh, uh, data, uh, you know, the data protection um, impact assessment. And it just wasn't done. Um, so the courts have now struck down uh, the Huduma number process yet again, and the government will appeal. Uh, but unfortunately, um, this is probably the hardest route to take. The easiest route would have been for them to simply comply with the law. Thank you very much, Al. Look forward to the conversation. And um, thanks again, once again, for inviting Amnesty to be part of this beautiful conversation.
Thank you so much, Irongo. Um, indeed, some, you know that uh, I remember when we were trying to do that, um, that um, you know, uh, conversation between trying to broker that conversation between government and um, the, the the litigator and trying to stave off the litigation and try to get them to agree. Um, we do try um, as much as we can to achieve as much as possible. Sometimes we succeed, sometimes we don't, and it's all part of the game, is it not? I am going to invite uh, Jackie Mungai, um, the founder of LIT. Um, we're very excited to have her here with us today. Um, Jackie, if you'll just put on your video so that I can confirm that I can see you. Um, fantastic. So Jackie, the, the floor is all yours. I think you're still muted, Jackie. Over to you. Um, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Alcanz, for giving me this opportunity to speak. My name is Jackie Mungai. I am the founder at Sweet Initiative in Malindi, Kenya. Um, I must admit that this is the very first time I am speaking in a high level forum. And I am very anxious. So I'd ask all of you to please be kind and bear with me. <laughs> um, at least we advocate for functional literacy, which we define as five things. Um, one, basic literacy, which is the ability to read and write. Um, two, uh, financial literacy, which is uh, the knowledge of money and how to use it, how to save it, how to invest it. Um, three, civic literacy, which is understanding about government processes and um, civic processes like voting and forms of government and structure and what have you. Um, also, uh, four, digital literacy, which is the ability, the knowledge of people being able to use their technical equipment so that they can help themselves. It is a highly dynamic society and digital literacy is very important among ourselves. And lastly, functional literacy for us is also um, life skills that one can be able to use knowledge, skills and attitudes to navigate the world. As a young girl, I went to school in a normal basic primary school here in Malindi. And because I grew up in a, a family that valued education and they also had the capacity to take me to school, I started pretty early. In my, in my class three, um, I met girls, I, I was with girls who were teenagers. Some of them were were very old, um, and one of them is Amina. She came from a very poor family, and often she would miss school because um, of lack of school fees. By the time uh, Amina was in class three, she was, she, she began, as a girl, she began having her periods, and it made life um, even harder for her. And because her family was not in a position to assist her that much, she could not afford sanitary towels. Amina would resort to asking some of the older boys, many of whom had already dropped out of school and they worked as border border riders. Border border riders are the um, motorbike taxis here in Kenya. And Amina would ask for assistance from her peers, the older boys who were out there and could be able to assist her. And the young men would demand for sexual favors in return. And in the course of all that, Amina got pregnant in, in, and um, her schooling abruptly stopped. She, at that time, she could barely be able to read and write. Um, she could barely develop an understanding of, of the world and, and how it worked. And suddenly, um, she was responsible for another human being. 
uh, she soon got married off and became a housewife. Today, Amina is 28 years old. She has seven children and the oldest is a teenager right now. And the challenges are the same. Amina is one of the many young people in my community that has that lived experience. I can introduce to you literally hundreds of 20 year olds in her position, both men and women. So as you all talk about data governance today, I urge you to think about Amina and how she is being left behind. I urge you to think about Kelvin, who is one of my adult literacy students. He has just opened his first um, savings account. And this has been in a period of six months since we started learning. It was so moving to watch um, Kelvin fill in a form in a bank, considering that in that six months, Kelvin didn't have the ability to read and write, how he never had the basic English um, and had, had gone to a banking hall for the very first time just a week before. I'd also, you, I'd also urge you to think about Benjamin, who is another of my adult literacy students. He is 21 years old. Benjamin is married to uh, a 19 year old. They are blessed with, uh, with a kid who is uh, around four. And Benjamin just discovered the other day how to shop in a supermarket. Just um, three months ago, we went to Mombasa. Mombasa is a city that is roughly two and a half hours from where I am. And that was Benjamin's first time to go to Mombasa city. One thing that is interesting about Benjamin is Benjamin and his wife is that both of them do not have identity cards. Now, our government has established a system. It is called NEMIS where children are supposed to register um, to register, uh, they're supposed to be registered at the basic level so that it can help registration for their final exams become easier. So most, most of the learners who are asked to, to go for the uh, registration documents have parents like Benjamin and his wife, who they themselves are not registered as, as citizens. And they do not know the value of, of having an identity card. And it, it places them in, in a limbo. I think about this. How do we expect these young people to vote wisely next year? How do we expect them to understand how to hold the government accountable? How do we expect them to understand county budgets that are out there? How do we expect them to understand that they have data that can be used for them and against them, and that um, they also have a voice? It all starts with functional literacy. And this is where my calling lies. I'd urge all of you to think about this issue that I have mentioned. And functional literacy for young adults is really a governance issue and you should care about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Jackie. Indeed, literacy is a governance issue and I think we could not have put it um, more passionately um, than you could have. Thank you very much. I, you know what, it is your first time to speak at the high level um, forum and we could not tell. Um, you, you seem very, very experienced. Um, well done. Um, at this point, we're gonna go into um, a short video um, that has been prepared for us. Um, and immediately after that video, I'm going to invite um, my brother, Tom Orell, um, to take us straight into our very first panel of the day. 
Um, so Q video, I guess I, I should say. Devolution in Kenya began in 2013 with the aim of bringing services closer to the citizens. This was a milestone in the right direction as we have often believed that real change happens where data and development meets real people. We believe that sustainable development can best be achieved at sub-national level, village by village, county by county, province by province. Governments also have a mandate to provide services and equitably allocate resources to their communities. What we have found through our work is that data is crucial to this end. For the government to deliver services, they must have numbers. For them to have numbers, they must engage citizens. We take the leave no one behind mantra seriously. This has greatly fueled the work that we do to find and give voice to people who are left behind using data for improved advocacy and agency. These include artisanal small-scale miners who eck out a living working without safety gear or equipment and often getting raw deals for their precious metals and stones that they mine. We aim to make every ASM be counted and their needs and prioritized amplified into action by government and other stakeholders. Persons with disabilities are often left out, especially in as far as accessibility is concerned. We have asked ourselves, could a person with disability come from one end of town to another independently and with dignity? What are the things that must happen to enable them? These thoughts inspired the ability project that mapped out every street in Nairobi and several other towns. Those maps are used as tools for advocacy. We have been privileged to work with county governments, collaborating with them to collect, analyze and build the capacity of their data offices. Through our Open County program, we have worked with several counties to promote open government at the grassroots. Most recently, we have engaged 10 data leaders county chief officers who have been part of our Data Leaders Fellowship program. We have been working with these data fellows to strengthen their county's data value chains with the goal of setting up county statistical units to manage county data. At the heart of our work is our collaboration with various partners and experts, from our fellow CSOs to development partners and governments. We keep working together to realize a dream of a prosperous continent with continuous improved livelihoods for their citizens and that sustains its own development. Welcome, Tom. Um, I, 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 I hope that you're able to put on your video now. I'm also having the uh, same challenges that Irungu did, um, but I'm sure that it will start momentarily. Hello, everyone. Here we are. I think it is now oh. working. <laughs> Good morning, um, afternoon, and evening to you all. Um, wow, what a what an opening to a to a conference. Um, honestly, I, I listening to Yama, uh, Irungu, and Jackie there. I, I think it should be obligatory now for every international conference to start with stories um, from the movers and shakers on the ground who you know for people like me who work at a at a more international level um you know it, it, it's a really important reminder for people like me um that everything that i do needs to be complementary and supportive to the work which people like irungo yama and jackie are doing um you know i've been working in the sustainable development field now for many years and the more that i continue working in this field the more i realize that my role is just a very small ancillary part um, and that my knowledge and skills should never really be in the foreground but should always be in the background just providing support to those people who who are really the movers and shakers in their communities all the way from those people in my neighborhood in the uk down to Melindi, where Jackie works. Um, 
it, it is important though that we do find complementarity between um, uh, international policy priorities and work which takes place at the subnational and national levels. And while we started with those stories at the subnational level, this panel is now going to take a much broader view from a regional and international level. It's going to, to basically reflect the global outlook on what the new normal is. Um, and the new normal here is defined as, as basically the COVID era. Um, Al and I initially started talking about the post-COVID era, but you know, I think that's almost a misnomer. That there isn't really a post-COVID era. There is just the new normal, um, which is how the world has shifted in light of COVID. So without further ado, I'd like to invite the panelists for this, uh, this section, section, Steve McFeely, Oliver Chinganya and Clement Lamid, please also switch their videos on and join me. So I'll just give them a moment and the organizers to set that up technically. Hello, Oliver, I can see you. Thank you very Hi, much for joining me. Yes, yes, clearly. Thank you so much. That's good. Let's just give the others a moment as well. I see that Claire and Steve are both here. Could you come off mute at least while the videos are setting up? Just so I know that you're there. Hi, Claire. Oh, there you are. Hi, Claire. And Steve is still muted, but I'm sure will join us momentarily. While we're waiting for Steve, um, why don't we start? Um, as I've just mentioned, you know, the the Buntwani on, on data governance this year um, opened with three really powerful um, messages and stories from three movers and shakers across the African continent. Um, we've heard about how governments have used the guise of COVID-19 to maximize their powers um, and to, to pass laws um, and pass emergency legislation, which greatly extends their power to, to grab and utilize data. We've heard about um, the challenges which accompany the digital revolution and the challenges in accountability and finding that on that sweet spot between the need to utilize data for development purposes, but also to protect people's rights. And we've heard very movingly, I think, and, and really a, a a succinct reminder to us all um, from Jackie about, you know, literacy being the cornerstone of everything and literacy being a governance issue. And as part of that, increasingly, the importance of digital literacy. And we've heard that both from Yama and Jackie. So thinking about the global outlook for the new normal, um, it would be really interesting to hear from you how you think COVID-19 has changed the outlook of global and regional institutions when it comes to, to using data innovatively for, for development purposes. Um, and I know that this is quite a broad question, but as Al said at the beginning, this point 20 should be a space for, for open and broad conversations and let's see what comes out of it. So what I'd like to do is just invite you each in turn to just give your names, affiliation, and you know, just very briefly tell us what your professional focus has been on during the pandemic. And to answer that question about how you think things have changed in light of COVID. Um, I'll start with you, Claire, just because you're the next in the, in the, in the, the, the series of, of videos, but I'd love to hear your thoughts um, on this question. Sure, thank you, Tom. And hi, everybody. It's great to be here. I'm a huge admirer of Bantwani and the and the work both of Data Ready and the Open Institute. So it's a real joy to, to be part of this conversation. And, and thank you very much for the invitation. Um, yeah, sorry, I should have also introduced my organization. Yeah, my net my net, I'm the CEO of the uh, of the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data, which rejoices in one of the longer names in a sector which is not known for its short for its shortness. Um, and um, we really focus on bringing together stakeholders to partly to have some of these conversations among a very broad global group 
comprised of governments, private sector, civil society, and so on. So we're always really happy to participate in this kind of discussion. It's very much our bread and butter. And also to get down to data partnerships in a very practical sense, working closely with governments. And our focus is very much on governments and data use in the public sector. Um, and working very closely with governments on sort of increasing the uptake of new data sources to close what we see as two critical gaps in data timeliness, which is obviously, as we know, a lot of data that's being used is out of date. And I think COVID brought home to us how you know absurd that is in many ways. Um, and equity in the sense of the gaps in data, you know, that leave systematically leave out groups of marginalized people who are already suffering multiple inequalities. Um, so that's our focus. I mean, if you want me to just come on very quickly to my perspective on that question, Tom, I mean, I think <laughs> there's a bit of a paradox here, really, in a way, isn't there? Or we're kind of coming at this from different ways. In one sense, COVID has absolutely, you know, we've been working very closely with, with Oliver's team at ECA, particularly through, uh, for the duration of the pandemic, you know, working um, with that team on sort of looking at the response of many African governments and the way in which governments are able to you take advantage of new sources to kind of mobilize data for the COVID response. And I think, you know, on the one hand, COVID has brought home the importance of data as really sort of rocket fueled the, the adoption of new methods and the political priority which is given to data. And, you know, for many of us, that's a reason to be, to sort of celebrate and to be pleased that, you know, you know, it's hard to disagree with the proposition that all things being equal, it's better that policy making is, is based on sort of more information rather than less. That's got to be better for all of us in terms of effective use of resources, in terms of kind of transparency, accountability, clarity of purpose, effective use of public funds, all the kinds of things that we like. But on the other hand, as you say, Tom, there's also this concern that, you know, where will it lead in a sense? And are there other more sinister things happening in the guise of what is also at the same time a really good thing? And I sort of think, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I'm really pleased to have this discussion. And there is this kind of dualism in the way that we've been thinking about data in the pandemic. And sometimes it's just about different people coming from different perspectives based on their kind of biases, where they sit in the conversation, the experiences they've had, their sort of particular um, starting points in this conversation. You know, and other times it's people sort of, in a sense, holding both views simultaneously and trying to reconcile that within the context of particular political processes and thinking about what that means in a very specific way in the execution of specific partnerships, specific regulatory frameworks and so on. I suppose that's more where we sit in the partnership is trying to kind of think quite practically about how one resolves this, this sort of, in a sense, COVID has sort of raised the stakes on both sides, the kind of positive story about the uses of data, the importance of data, and correspondingly the, the, the fears that that has brought along with it. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. I think these are, it's a really interesting way to frame it in in that sense and i think you've hit the nail on the head and i completely agree right which is it, it, it's really tricky um it's 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 often a question of of degree and of subjectivity as to where we draw the line between what should or shouldn't be done given all these competing needs and i'd, I'd actually like to turn to oliver as the the other half of, of of the partnership um in terms of the work that has been being done across Africa to, to strengthen local capacities and, and local institutions' ability to, to better use new sources of data as part of the COVID response. And Oliver, I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on the same question of, of what's changed as a result of COVID, and also any, any thoughts you might have on what, on, on what Claire's just said. Um, and I'm thinking in particular, you know, given your, your focus on statistical systems in particular, um, if you could speak a little bit to, to any issues of trust that have arisen um, as a result of COVID, you know, are people, are citizens in Africa trusting the information that's coming out of statistics offices? Um, what are some of the barriers and challenges there um, in, in your experience? And do, do, do people trust new sources of information as well? Um, you know, any thoughts that you might have on some of those questions would be greatly appreciated. Over to you, Oliver. 
Well, first of all, thank you so much, uh, Tom, for inviting me to this, this forum. I think it's the first time I'm participating in this uh, particular forum. Uh, I, I actually wanted to, add, to sort of uh, ask also the actual pronunciation of this Ubuntu uh, in, in Kiswahili. So I've been struggling to find that word and well, pronounce it well. So, but that will be for another time. I'll, like, I'll ask Davis to, to do that. So my name is Oliver Chingangas for, for the rest that are, are not familiar who I am. And so I work for the, um, the African Center for Statistics at UNECA, which is based in Addis. Uh, and the focus for us really at the African Center for Statistics is to provide sustainable support uh, in statistics uh, to UN member countries on the continent. That's all the 54 member countries of the UN and in all areas of statistics. And we work with the uh, various member, um, uh, other regional economic uh, commissions, uh, communities rather, but also with partners, including the Global Partnership on Sustainable Development, with whom really we have worked very, very well in providing solutions uh, and, and, and tools during the, the pandemic. But uh, coming to the question that Tom, you're raising, first of all, I, I want to pick on uh, what uh, uh, Claire has said, that you know the, the stakes are on both sides, the suppliers as well as the providers of data, and that's what COVID has done. COVID has an certain things that we didn't realize. The vulnerabilities, first of all, of the statistical systems uh, in, in, on the continent, not just about the national statistical system, but even other systems that are not even you know, uh, related to statistics, but producing some kind of data. Things that we didn't know that, you know, you know we, when we face such an, um, a crisis, uh, we would have a, a data uh, kind of a crisis in terms of obtaining it, um, transmitting it, and in packaging in the manner that will be used. So that, that, that has created a lot of um, uh, uncertainties in a sense that uh, we've seen some of the institutions really collapsing, not being able to collect data. For instance, on the civil registration, we've seen a lot of things happening there. Mothers not going to the places to register their births, uh, their children that have been born, death not being registered. Some of the COVID cases went buried without having to recognize that they were actually the, the, the people died. And so th those are issues of data. And those are the, some of the issues that when people talk about governance, how do we deal with those things when data is not being recorded for various uh, situations that we face? So the changes what we have seen is that, uh, uh, first of all, the data, the data providers uh, in this, uh, so the suppliers in this case, they've been put in a very vulnerable situation because then they want to get some information the government is insisting to get to collect certain some kind of information, and they don't even know how that information is going to be used. But because they are in a hurry, they, they have this age to, 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 to receive certain information, say around COVID. They provide us that all sorts of information. They are being told, look, you have to provide this information for us to do certain, to provide you the necessary services. But the question they don't ask, how are you going to protect that data? That information is never provided to the supplier. And, and that's a problem. And I, I, don't, I don't really think that um, this is a situation that can be easily be resolved now because so much information has gone out to the public, to the government, to the private sector, and that in re reversing it, even if we are to attempt to reverse it, if you think about the, the situation, the example that uh, Irunga was talking about, the, you know, his car uh, and being identified, uh, that information, we don't even know how it landed up there. Who else that has that information? So really maybe the, what we should be talking about in terms of making changes in uh, going forward is how can those that have information be trusted? And I, I don't think one would want to trust them because we don't know who else they've shared that information with. So it, we are going to talk about trust and trust and trust, but we don't know how much we can trust because it, there's only so much they can you know, share the information the, and, and, and to whom they have shared, they provide the information with. But however, the information that lands up with the national statistical system, we can be guaranteed that we can trust the system because this is a system that uses international standards, the UN fundamental principles, official statistics, and they have to abide with that. So we know that that information can be trusted. But the information that sits with what are called data enthusiasts, people that are not statisticians, but they like to have data and they are able to produce, to have tools that, and solutions that policy makers will be able to listen to, that would be difficult to really say that we can trust that information. Can I, can I just challenge you a little bit on that point and just push you a bit on, on and think, I'm, I'm thinking of what Jackie said before about, um, uh, you know, about data literacy being the cornerstone. Right. So how, how does somebody, how does one of Jackie's students 
um, learn to differentiate between what data is coming from the statistics authority and is trustworthy and what information is out there from, you know, some random person and is not trustworthy. What, you know, from, from your vantage point, you know, overseeing the whole continent um, and working together with, with so many different um, authorities, um, are there any programs or steps um, which are in place to help to, to help to teach people on, on how to differentiate between trustworthy and non-trustworthy information in light of COVID and some of the challenges that you've mentioned there? Yeah, there isn't really any kind of guidelines or framework that sort of guides uh, anyone to say, look, this is what you would consider public official data, this is not. Other than uh, having to look at the sources themselves, that is the only guideline that one has is say, look, what is the source of this data? Who publishes this data? So if, if, if you look at the source, then you will be looking at the official sources of data, then you say, look, this I'll trust. Um, anything that is not official, you'll use the data, but also with a lot of uh, caveats around it, uh, whether to trust it or not. Uh, because you, you have no way of validating that because you, know, you probably cannot even trust the person that produced that data in the first place. And, and, and even if you were to trust that person is, or the agency itself, what mechanism do they use or employ in collecting that data to make sure that it's validated? So it is really difficult. So at the moment, there, there are no mechanism and I'm, I, I, I think they'll be, to be very difficult rather than just to guide people to say, look, can you ensure that you ask for the source of data and the publisher? As that would be the only way, because no matter what mechanism that you put there, people will choose what data to use. Uh, whether they use an official data, it depends on the need. And this morning I was, I, I was talking to uh, on another platform and I said, look, as official statisticians, one of the things that we risk um, uh, and, you know, is that the fact that we're having data enthusiasts and others that are in a different arena of statisticians or people that like data, uh, and they are very quick at finding solutions. And this, these are solutions that policymakers are listening to because they produce them in real time. Well, an official statistician, you have to wait uh, for a couple of uh, months, years to get the data. So if you are not careful, statisticians can end up being validators of data that comes out from what I call data enthusiasts. Yeah, it's, a, it, it, it's one of those major challenges within a data revolution generally, right? This, there's this constant pressure for information immediately, immediately, immediately. But the reality is that for data to be trustworthy, it has to go through certain steps to be validated and that sometimes immediacy comes at the cost of quality. Um, and it's, you know, th that's one of those big questions. And I think COVID has absolutely exacerbated um, that, uh, those sets of tensions as well. Thank you very much, Oliver. We, we will come back to some of these points um, and perhaps for you and Claire to think about while I turn to, um, to Steve, is, is this question about, you know, this, this, this need for literacy, um, which is so prevalent around the world, it's not just an African issue, we see it um, all around the world of people being led astray in all kinds of directions about what information is trustworthy or not trustworthy um, when it comes to COVID. And I think it, it genuinely is one of the big crises of our time. Um, and I'd, I'd love to hear um, whether in this conversation or another time, um, you know, some some reflections from, from both of you who've been part of such, this crucial partnership um, about how, how we can move forward to overcome some of those tensions. Um, with that said, turning to Steve, um, I, you know, I think we're very, very lucky to have you here today, um, given your background at UNCTAD, um, which is the Conference for Trade and Development for the UN Conference for Trade and Development for those who are unfamiliar, and more recently your role within the World Health Organization. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on, on this question of, of how COVID has changed things um, when it comes to, to data use. Um, and any reflections that you might have on the conversation so far as well. Over to you, Steve. Okay, thanks, Tom. Um, hello, everybody. My pleasure to be here. So my name is Steve McFeely, as Tom said. I'm currently the Director of Data and Analytics um, at the World Health Organization. So when I think about data and COVID, first of all, I'm, I'm not sure that COVID really changed the outlook for global and regional institutions. If I think of statistical institutions uh, per se, so I, I think what COVID did more was it actually reinforced views that were already held. Um, and critically that 
access to all types of secondary data, whether those are administrative or commercial, are now existentially important for NSOs and for international statistical organizations. And I think allied with that, I think what it did, COVID has really provoked a discussion now within the statistical community regarding the relevance of current statistical legislation and, and even the fundamental principles of official statistics. I think now there's a growing sense that they may need to be upgraded because there was too many barriers to access uh, when we really needed the data. That said, what, what COVID did do is I think it fundamentally changed the cost benefit analysis that a statistical office would have to go through. So I think a lot of long standing blockages were swept aside by COVID. So a lot of statistical offices had the freedom to modernize in a way that maybe they haven't been able to for a long time because they didn't have the resources and the gatekeepers would have been saying the cost benefits didn't work out. Suddenly faced with the, the crises that uh, Oliver mentioned, that the normal data collection mechanisms just collapsed and they really had to surge ahead with moving to online platforms and digitizing, modernizing. So that, that's been a benefit that, that, that's come out of COVID. Um, I think two other things, what, what COVID has shown is that, again, something that we already knew, but I think COVID has really reinforced the message that marrying GIS and official statistics now needs to be a standard operating procedure. Like we can't think of marrying GIS and statistics now as innovation. That has to just be kind of standard uh, because it just, it really opens up so many avenues. Um, more broadly though, I, I think back to something Claire mentioned, I, I, again, we, we saw something that we suspected, but which is the inequalities around access to data and around data use. Um, that really became, um, kind of evident over the last two years. And then finally, one last thing I, I would say, which was a kind of a frustration is the growing asymmetry between public and private sector data use. Um, like a question for me really coming out after COVID was why so many kind of IT platforms enjoyed so much freedom to produce new types of statistics, harvesting social media data and so forth. And yet NSOs were faced with really significant constraints from data protection commissioners and so forth, that they weren't allowed to do the equivalent type of work. And I think that's really problematic. And, and I, I think it touches on really frustrations maybe that Oliver was um, kind of voicing. And I think it does raise a question too, in a crisis, in, in a data driven world, why weren't NSOs designated as critical function in many states. So we, we saw hospitals being designated as critical functions, certain jobs, but statistics weren't. And, and I think that absence kind of does tell you something about the understanding at government level of the criticality of, of data and the criticality of official data, um, as opposed to just any old data. So I'll, I'll stop I there. I think you've, you've, you've summarized what both Oliver and Claire were talking about in in really lucid terms there um, and if I can just if I can just wrap my head around it and paraphrase it I think it's actually a really really um, important insight that I personally hadn't thought of before in, in those terms which is that perhaps one of the major governance challenges that we face when it comes to data is that on the one hand we have nowhere near enough regulation when it comes to private entities but on the other hand we have far too much and outdated regulation when it comes to the to data use and innovative data use by public sector um uh bodies such as national statistics offices for those who might not be familiar nso's and national statistics offices and I think that that's a really important insight, actually, because it, it, it touches upon so many of these, these themes and so many aspects that, that we've discussed. Um, as Oliver was saying, you know, in the vast majority of cases, we can trust official statistics. Um, and if we don't trust them, in most countries, there are avenues to effectively challenge um, them. 
and and they they have oversight and accountability mechanisms in place um and the same can't be said for for untested private um you know number creation um i hesitate to use the word statistical creation so i'd, I'd love to hear claire and oliver's thoughts on on that point and, and whether they agree with this concept that perhaps um, there's not enough regulation in many places of how the private sector uses data, but there's too much or outdated regulation of how national statistics offices and other public institutions utilize data. And while they're doing that, um, while Oliver and Claire respond a bit to that, um, a question for you, Steve, for you to think about is, is in the chat, and it's this latest question that we have from John Stone um, Kumaraki. I hope I've pronounced that correctly, apologies if not, um, asking about whether it's tenable for national statistics offices to have such a, um, such a broad mandate. Um, so Claire, over to you um, to respond to some of these thoughts and then to you, Oliver, while Steve, you think about that question. Thank you. Thank you. No, I mean, like you, I think it's a, it's a really kind of interesting framing and, and an important insight, I guess. I guess the question for me is always kind of too much or too little regulation compared with what and kind of relative to what you know how do we well, how are we defining here what enough regulation is in the public sector or in the private sector and i think you know i was thinking this as as oliver was speaking i think there's a kind of i mean for <laughs> there's a sort of slightly odd again sort of way that we're thinking about this you know in some ways, what is happening with data is part of a trend towards the kind of decentralization of power over information, over connection, lots of things that essentially, you know, they used to be used to get your information from, you know, one or two radio stations, one or two newspapers that were privately run, you could pick them largely according to your politics, and those were your choices. Now, of course, we've seen a huge decentralization of information with the Internet, and that includes the raw data on which that information is based. And, you know, that has kind of good or bad consequences. It's been experienced as kind of hugely empowering for some people who've been liberated from a very sort of fixed worldview, from worldviews which are very, you know, dominated by a kind of single political outlook or a you know, a single, and I think, you know, and the same goes for data. If you live in a world in which your entire worldview is shaped by those statistics, which the government deems to be the official truth, that's pretty limiting. You know, I'm not sure any of us would really want to live in that world and not allow those statistics to be challenged by, you know, the data that's collected by civil society organisations, according to kind of other definitions of what's important outside of the categories laid down by official statistics and all those other things. So I think, you know, I think on the one hand, the democratisation of information, which is represented by the expansion of data sources, is a really good thing. And it's a sort of surprises me sometimes that people don't see data in the same category as other information sources which we celebrate when they are liberated in a sense but on the other hand you know we're also seeing increasingly with covid not just with data but everything else the dark side of that in the form of missing you know once you leave it up to people to decide what they think is important some people for different reasons are going to make decisions that you don't like and we're seeing that with all the kind of misinformation that's flying around, that's affecting our politics in many different countries, that's affecting the COVID response, uptake of vaccinations and so on. But I think, you know, sometimes the response to this is to regulate the information itself. And that is a kind of temporary, I think, solution, but in a digital age, people are always gonna find ways around that, that's finite. You know, ultimately the solution is to make people want to seek out good information and to make them kind of want to be questioning you know ultimately the solutions this are always political you know you have to have enough people who want to kind of do what any of us and probably we all have a slightly different conception of this might consider to make to be good choices to persuade governments who want on the whole most governments now are democratic who want to be re-elected to do those things that's how this process is supposed to work I mean I think all these things come down to politics in the end but as I say I think for me the you know it's helpful sometimes to see the kind of data conversation in that broader context data is one source of information that you know is going through a particular kind of upheaval there are many others 
And there has always been this contest between the desire of people in power to control information and the desire of people outside of power to define their own truths. And sometimes that is positive. Sometimes the people in power the controls that they want to pose add to the general sum of knowledge, as in the case of official statistics and tried and trusted regulations, other times not so much. But I think, you know, that's the context we're operating in. And I would hesitate to make any sort of blanket official statistics always good, private sector statistics always bad in that context. I think that would be quite anti-democratic and actually lead to the centralization of power in ways that would undo a lot of the good that we're seeing when we're thinking about different sources of data and how that can empower communities to define their own truths, as well as sometimes lead to misinformation. Some excellent points there. And I'd, I'd be really interested to hear what Oliver thinks about some of that as well. And I'll invite him to, to talk to that in a moment. But before doing that, seeing as you've, you've mentioned power, um, and I, I, I completely agree, I think, you know, we work in this incredibly complex um, matrix of social interactions, essentially, where all kinds of information are, are absolutely important, official, unofficial, whatever we want to call them. And th the beauty of the world is that in mo most of the world, we do get to discuss them and make our own assumptions and be subjective. And that that reflects the, the you know, the broadness of the, of, of the human condition. Um, but you did mention politics. And one of the questions that we have from a participant um, is, is how can individuals actually exert their agency um, more in relation to information, both about themselves, but about their communities, you know, as institutions vie for power? This is my reading of the question, if, if I understood it correctly. Um, I'm just scrolling back up here. Um, you know, and they say the, the issue of data is also intricately tied to power, whether by NGOs, governments and private companies. Um, are there any recourses besides legal, so I'm not talking about legal, um, for citizens to reclaim some of this agency, so some agency and power? Um, I know, Claire, that, that within the Global Partnership, you're, you're working on the Digital Values Project, which both Al and I are also involved in. Um, you know, are there any early insights um, from there, for instance, that you could draw on about avenues for people to regain agency and power over their information? I mean, I'm not going to speak to the, the data values project, as, as you know, better than I as a sort of as a, a complicated um, and really exciting conversation that's kind of going on in real time. So I think it'd be premature for me to say this is the, what the data values project has decided. But I mean, my view on this, which probably doesn't shape the data values project that much because I'm not involved in a lot of the conversations, thankfully. Um, but um, is thankfully for you that is not for me i wish i was more involved but anyway <laughs> um is there's, there's no single answer you know i think data can both empower and disempower different kinds of data in different kinds of contexts and what you want to do is think about the different things so obviously you want people to have more power over the data which is about you know you want to have you want people to be more empowered as data subjects you know the data that is about them for them to have more agency and i think the word agency is one that you keep coming back to i know in the data values project and i think is a really really helpful term here certainly really opened my eyes to a kind of really useful way of thinking about this um so i think you know you want to ways for people to reclaim age it doesn't always mean that you want to directly give people power over specific individual pieces of data about them because sometimes the greater good might be served by you know people up giving up some of their data rights in order to create a kind of pool of data that can be used for epidemiology for sociology for the big things where you need to pool data so i don't think agency relates to you know to privatization of data rights in a sense and every individual having their own little cash that they can kind of hawk around to the highest bidder um but I also think that data can give power to people in a different way where they collect their own data and use that to influence policy. So I think there's kind of data people need to, in a sort of slightly more passive way, reclaim their power over data. But I think people also need to use more actively use data as a tool in by themselves. And there are fantastic examples. I'm sure there are a lot of people in the audience who can, you know, who have, you know, have been doing really important work on the way in which data itself can be a tool of power for people one of not 
ever the only, you know, there's never one that's ever going to unlock all the others, but a tool for people to reclaim some power as well. So I think, and I think we're talking about different kinds of data in different contexts. The work, you know, you got to unpack what you mean a bit here before I think you can come to any kind of sensible ideas about the pathways that through which data can lead to people increasing their power. Thanks, Claire. Thanks for those reflections. And I'll turn to Oliver now um, to see what he thinks about some of what you've said in particular around, you know, the need for a plurality of data sources um, within the national statistical system and within, within national data ecosystems and, and just society generally. Um, in your last comments, Oliver, if I understood you correctly, we spoke a little bit about trust and, and you spoke about when it comes to COVID in particular, um, it's really important for people to be able to discern between official sources of information and potential misinformation that's out there. And, you know, reflecting a bit on what Claire has said about the value of having lots of different types of information um, available to people, what are some of the tools and ways in which you think people can, can navigate that? Um, we did touch on this in your last comments, but I, I really do think it's worth reflecting a little bit on, given what we've heard from Yama and Irungu and Jackie as well about how how there's been so much controversy and challenge when it comes to, to accessing accurate information about COVID. Um, is there anything more that, that you think could be done at the regional level from, from where you sit in future? Um, is that something that you've thought about at this stage or are there other priorities that are more important for the time being? Hey, hey, Tom, are you able to hear me? Um, somehow you are breaking towards the end. Okay, so I've just changed to another device um, because the other one was failing me. Yeah, first of all, I, I want to agree with Claire when uh, she says that, uh, you know, both uh, official and non-official data can actually be good. Uh, but what is critical, I think, you know, um, for the non-official data is to, to establish the source, you know, and this is where most of this fake news is about. So it's very, very important, I think, that we establish uh, before using that data, this is a credible source. It's not official, but it's a credible source. And this is why we have big data anyway, because big data, usually most of it is not non-official. So there is uh, credibility uh, with non-official data. What's important is you know, it's just this, you know, establishing the source. So I agree with the, what, what uh, Claire says. But let me, before I come back to your question, let me address this issue, issue about uh, whether there is enough regulations uh, you know, and so forth. I think to me, the power in the data is in the person or the agents that has the data because the agents or the person decides how and when that data should be used and to whom and for what purpose. And, 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 and therefore, if the agency does not have the, uh, the appropriate regulation that governs the data that they have in their possession, to make sure that it conforms with the available regulations nationally. I mean, could be in the statistical act or in whatever legislation that is available, then that becomes a problem. Because the, the tendency then is that uh, if one has no value, has no ethical uh, uh, you know, understanding, then they can produce whatever. So really the discretion is on, on the agency and, and, and the individual to say, look, is this something that can put up in the public? But oftentimes what you have seen is that um, it's when you have it, uh, you, you just want to get it, you want to be the first person that puts it out in the public, even without having to think about it so much. And that is where the problem is, because then you are not taking into consideration the people that uh, you are going to be providing information to, what it do, how it would impact on them. And especially if it is in relates to their own credibility, that becomes a problem. So I think that uh, the regulations, like, um, uh, like uh, Claire said, what is enough? I think there's enough regulations there, but it's just a question of uh, how do people really use uh, the available regular legislations and so forth. And 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 you know you can come up with you know whatever, but you know, in as far as I'm concerned, I think there's enough legislation to govern that. It's a question of people whether they have the values to respect what is available. That is where the problem is. So in terms of the sources of of, of data. I think the, the, the national status quo, they're sort of constrained, especially in Africa, they're sort of constrained. Why? Because their systems are not well modernized to deal with other sources of data. 
they are not digitalized uh, system. The processes uh, lack that. I mean, we've seen under COVID in, in particular, uh, even collection of simple data like for consumer price index. Some of the yes, they were not able to collect the data because they could not go to an agent or to a marketeer uh, to collect the data because the marketeer was, was not ready to receive them because of, of fear of uh, contracting uh, uh, COVID. Similarly, even the enumerator could not go there. But then there was no other way of creating data other than just to wait until COVID sort of uh, subsides or you know, minimizes. Uh, and, and it is now that we are talking about coming up with different approaches of creating data or a hybrid of traditional ways of creating data with the technology. So that there is a thinking now uh, using data science approaches. Um, the UN has also helped us coming up with what we call the regional, uh, regional hub. Uh, the solutions that we've gained out of the partnership that we have with Claire's uh, shop, that those mechanisms that begin to change the way they are thinking, and also that we have, we can no longer just think of traditional surveys, but you can collect data in other ways, administrative and other sources, web scraping and so forth. So the thinking is different now, uh, which is helpful, and I think that that is perhaps one would say the benefit of uh, having gone through a crisis like this it makes uh, different ways of thinking uh, and, and much more independent way of doing things. Uh, that's that's how I look at it. That you know. Uh, you know, for now, Tom. Yeah, thanks. I think I think that makes a lot of sense, right? And you know, I've I'm I'm part of the global partnership as well, and I've been you know following the 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 rollout and development of the 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 partnership that you have, and it's extremely impressive, right? And filling gaps which are which are absolutely present, and it's really important as well to remember those challenges that you that you mentioned. Um, which are fundamental, right? That during the pandemic with lockdowns and curfews and the rest of it, statistical offices have been, um, have not been able to essentially undertake routine data collection and statistics have suffered as a result of that. There's a couple of questions um, from, from participants that Oliver, I think it would be really interesting to hear your comments on before we move back to Steve. Um, the first is a question from Charlene who asks whether there are success stories of countries that have been able to address the private sector regulation challenge. So can you think of any countries across Africa where there is this a, a good balance um, uh, in, terms of, in terms of how, how data ecosystems operate? And then the second question, um, I think this links to what you were saying at the end of your comments there about how statistics offices um, can create these hybrid systems, to use your words, where they utilize some data they collect themselves and some data that they, they collect externally. But in, the question here relates to the lack of capacity and resources that NSOs have to, to frequently collect and produce data. Um, and the question is, do you think that by regulating civil society organizations um, to feed into national repositories, um, in this way, we could also contribute to better data governance. Um, so I'd be interested in your thoughts there, not just from private sector data, but also civil society data as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, first of all, I, th I think striking the balance and the use of balance may be a misuse of the word, because I think the, we are far from really having a balance. I think what is possible and what we are seeing in countries is countries begin to identify the private, some of the private sector they can actually work with. We've seen um, uh, some countries opting to work, for instance, with ESRI, um, you know, to partner with them and be able to call it, you know, use their, 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 their scale of, uh, of knowledge in that area. We have seen others going to Grid and so forth, others going to Facebook. But not all countries uh, have, you know, taken that path. Uh, because of resources, because sometimes you know, if you, if you have to access some of these ones, you need resources to access data from satellites, for instance, that you must pay for that. And that's a big, big, big problem and a big challenge for most of the countries. On the question of regulating the civil society, I don't think it's an issue of regulating. It's a question of, can we partner with the civil society? And one of the things really I, I, I talk about these days when I talk national statistics, I say, look, Civil society, NGOs, the private sector, the academia, they are critical partners. And I think somehow you must be able to, as a national statistics office, embrace them to begin to work with them because they, they hold so much, so much data and so much power in the sense that they are the ones that are actually in touch more with the citizens. So having to work with them closely, uh, you know, include them in the design of questionnaires, in the analysis, doing the census, can we can they participate in the thematic? Uh, um, uh, analysis, analysis, for instance, of the census uh, data. And then that would be very helpful because they bring 
a different perspective, both the quantitative, but much more the qualitative, because they do a lot of uh, surveys that are you know, focused uh, at season. So I think for me, it's not regulating them, but finding ways of working with them. Because regulating them gives them an opportunity to even think of another window of producing data in a different form that the, might not be uh, accepted. So I think it is working in, you know, with these, what I would consider, trusted partners, uh, civil society, the private sector, academia, really together uh, as, as, an, as, as one. And I think this, that potential to embrace them becomes critical to me. Thanks, Oliver. That's really, that's really helpful. And we, we've, we've, we've heard now from you, Angela, in quite some detail about some of these issues. And I'd, I'd like to turn to Steve um, to hear a bit more about, uh, about the World Health Organization's perspective. I think that a lot of our audience would be really interested to hear um, what some of the, the challenges have been for the World Health Organization when it comes to data use um, and what some of their future plans are. Well, while we do turn to Steve, um, we're coming up towards the end of this panel, um, and I wanted to leave you and Claire with a question to think about while, I, while, while Steve um, talks, which is, what do you want the new normal to look like um, in this, in this post-COVID era or COVID, <laughs> you know, the present that we live in and, and the world that we live in now that COVID has happened? Um, what's your aspiration um, for say the next five years, what are the things that you would you would like to take forward from this experience um, and to improve um, data governance the way that you see it in the next five years or so? So while you're thinking about about that question, which I'll come back to you on, um, Steve, um, if you could perhaps give us a bit more insight about, you know, some of the challenges that the World Health Organization has had over the pandemic in terms of access to, to information and use of data and what you think some of the lessons have been for the organization that would be that would be really helpful and i think very interesting to, to many of our listeners over to you steve the who has been in the in the center of this uh, maelstrom for the last 18 months so I, I guess one of the big recognitions and it's still an ongoing debate within the who is currently there's a big distinction drawn between emergency and routine data um, and there's a big discussion around governance there's no final consensus on this yet but like my view is Drawing a distinction between emergencies and routine hasn't been helpful. Um, I think it's confusing both within the WHO and outside users. I think there has to be one overarching governance mechanism. And that, that, that governance mechanism must address both emergencies and non-emergencies. Um, I guess some of the other things that we've been reflecting on it, it, it touches on a lot of what we just heard about. I mean, for sure, it's obvious WHO lost a lot of ground in the kind of media battle, if you want to call it that. If, if you want to look at COVID statistics, you probably don't go to WHO, you go to John Hoskins. And why was that? So it, it's the, the challenge of an intergovernmental mechanism that requires a lot of uh, feedback from countries, a lot of sign off from countries, that's where the difference between emergencies and routine really becomes an issue. So ordinarily we produce statistics, we then send it back to the countries, we get sign off. And that's fine for the normal run of events. Um, in a crisis though, that clearly doesn't work. And it clearly doesn't work for two reasons. One is just the, the obvious time element. But the second one is you don't have time to address sensitivities. So not all countries are equally sanguine about producing statistics that somehow reflect, they, in their perception, badly on their administration. And clearly during COVID, the handling of COVID has become a, a, a kind of a metric of government performance. So we, we saw that during the US elections in particular, but for sure we're gonna see it in, in, in other elections in democratic countries in the coming years. So how governments performed, 
The problem with that is it puts immense pressure on those statistics because now those statistics have now taken on a meaning beyond you know, what happened in the country. It now becomes a, a, a metric of government performance. And that straight away brings sensitivities. So governments start becoming super sensitive about what you say about them. And that's an issue I, I think we're going to have to confront uh, with governments because in, in the governance kind of framework that we're developing, we're really trying to push the idea of uh, global public good, that the data are open, they're transparent. And you know, so straight away we have this tension. So for example, Next month, we're going to publish the, the first set of um, COVID-related excess mortality estimates uh, for all countries broken down by sex and by age. We've done a country consultation for this, but this time what we've said is this is a consultation, but we're not saying no, we're, we're not taking no for an answer unless you can provide credible evidence to challenge the model estimates that we produce. So just saying we don't like the estimates, that's not sufficient. Un unless you can actually provide robust evidence to challenge our estimates, then we're gonna publish them. And, and we've seen for sure tensions in countries, um, but this is something so that with the, with the excess mortality, we've had time to do the analysis. We didn't have that time with, with just COVID. And, so to prepare for the next crisis, whenever that will be, whatever that will be, this is something we're really going to have to kind of grasp this nettle and say, look, this didn't serve the world well um, by not having WHO estimates. Now, at least in the case of John Hoskins, I don't think that, that there's any, we don't have the issue that we don't think anything they were doing wasn't robust or that we, we don't have any issue in the sense that we don't think that the data are misleading. But nevertheless, it's embarrassing for us and, 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 it, and it, it, it's not good that the, the organization that's tasked with producing the kind of the, the, the definitive estimates on, on health really wasn't, be, wasn't able to produce estimates on COVID. So I think that's that, that, that's really a, a live issue that's come out of COVID is how do we build a, a governance mechanism that still allows conversation with government, al allows feedback, but can deal with rapidly evolving situations. And, and it happens all the time, but it's never had the, the focus of COVID. So every, every time there's a, a tsunami, every time there's a something, there's a crisis, but the estimates don't get the same amount of attention at least globally, you know. So if the estimates in Haiti are challenged by the government, there's probably nobody really cares except for Haiti because everybody else is just watching from a distance. Because we had a global issue, everybody was concerned with the estimates. Um, and, and, and that's really brought this issue to a, to a head. That's fascinating. I think that, that you know, it's almost unprecedented, right? In in terms of the scale and the scope of of those um, uh, of those challenges and those tensions between member states and the institution itself, trying to fulfil its its mandate and its function and maintain its integrity. Um, so it's a very tricky position to be in, and I'd be very interested in your thoughts in a moment on on what your hopes are. Um, for the WHO in relation to, to some of these issues in, in say five years, where would you like the organization to be? Um, but, and I'll come back to you last and give you a moment to think about that and, and perhaps go back to Claire and Oliver with that same question of in thinking about this new normal that we're in, Claire, where, where would you like the world to be when it comes to, to the data revolution and, and data use um, and some of the issues that we've discussed today? Any any final reflections or thoughts? I mean, for me, I think my hopes are very much on the demand side. And I think I assume that if we get the demand right, the supply will follow, which may be a facile economics assumption. But nonetheless, I think, you know, is, isn't a bad sort of rule of thumb here. And I think, um, you know, I think what COVID has done has massively increased the demand for data. And as Steve's just been saying, really interestingly, you know, institutions have sometimes found it difficult to adapt to that and to sort of seize the moment. But I do think 
collectively we need to seize that moment and clearly that involves challenging transitions for different institutions and we all need to think about you know what is our role if that if the ultimately what we're seeing is a kind of huge and permanent let's hope and that is my hope increase in the demand for data then what does that mean for the role of different institutions different data sources and so on i mean i think steve's point about um you know governments sometimes being a bit less transparent than would be desirable about for example figures that make them look not quite so great is another reason again to come back to the earlier conversation about why you sometimes actively want alternative data sources even if they don't quite fulfill the same standards of rigor to provide at least an alternative viewpoint on that so i do think you know i think what we're seeing is a hugely increased demand for data increasing expectations i would hope that stays i hope governments continue to care as much about data and the use of data in policy making and resource allocation decisions as they have done and i hope that people continue to do crazy things like log on to websites to see what the figures are that day only for a whole range of other things other than just covid um and you know and that we're sort of seeing this kind of one-off step change in how much people want data and care about data and expect decisions to be made on data and that with that in their pocket in a sense then we can get on with thinking about what is the regulatory and the institutional regime that we need nationally and globally to respond effectively to that demand but for me it's the demand pull that is really the exciting thing here Great, thank you. So in a, in a word there, the demand pull that COVID has created. So that's, I think, the first reflection um, for the, that we can draw um, in terms of a, a conclusion. Um, Oliver, um, the same question to you, where, where would you like to see things land in terms of this new normal as a result of COVID? What, what are your aspirations for the future um, based on the lessons learned and, and, and yeah. the experience of, of having worked through this pandemic? Yeah, I think while well, agreeing with uh, Claire that it is on the demand side, but I also think that uh, the issue of accountability on the part of the data suppliers will be critical. I think as citizens, they need to find a way uh, of making sure that those who are collecting data are accountable uh, because they have so much data. So before you collect data from me, I must find out certain things from you who's collecting data from me. So accountability, they must demand accountability on the part uh, of those that are collecting data and how that data is going to be used. So yes, demand, but I think accountability, you know, as citizens, they need to demand and to know how that data is going to be used. Uh, they've already given so much data, uh, but uh, now I think the next step is really to say, look, yes, we've given so much data, but uh, uh, if you're coming back to me, I, I want to know uh, what you're going to do, what will be my benefit out of that data. So there must be need uh, a, a need for giving up, giving whatever I want to give, I must, it must be need. I know that there's something I'm going to get out of it. And that is the issue of accountability. I think being accountable will be, to me, is where we should be sitting in addition to demand. Excellent. Thank you very much, Oliver. So, so far we have, you know, the pull um, generated by COVID, the by pull, I, I mean, the, the demand and the need for information and for data. On the other hand, we've got the need for accountability to counteract that pull. And Steve, you know, thinking about the conversation we just had and, and what you were saying about where you would like things to change within the WHO, um, is there anything you'd like to add um, in terms of what your aspirations are in this new normal and, and how you would like to see the lessons of this pandemic learnt with, within the institution and organisation um, and things change in yeah, sure. I'll, I'll talk about it within WHO and without, if I might. So within, I mean, generally what we want to see is a better equilibrium between this this deluge or this massive increase in supply of data and being able to use and turn those data into use, usable statistics and information. So at the moment, there's, there's, there's a massive increase in data, massive increase in expectations on the and that's on the supply side. On the demand side, the expectations are there, but we're not managing to convert all of that. So the, the production machine isn't working efficiently um, in that we're not, we're not producing statistics from, given the increase in the supply, we're not really harnessing it. Within WHO, what I'd like to say specifically is what we hope to do in the next probably two years 
is set up a new international conference on health statistics. The purpose of this conference isn't just to have a conference, it's actually to properly regulate the standards on health statistics in the same way that the International Labour Statistics Conference would do the same. So at the moment, we don't really have a governance mechanism that sets out the global standards for health statistics. Um, so that's one thing we want to do. And as part of that, we want to kind of address and develop a more efficient governance mechanism that can de deal with routine and emergency situations. And then more broadly, more broadly, just across the UN, both myself and Oliver are members of a thing called the CCS, which is the Committee of Chief Statisticians of the UN system. And just for information, we've been tasked by the CEB, which is the governing board of the United Nations, to start preparing a, a, a global data compact, which would be like a, a, a bill of rights, if you want, um, to deal with data. Uh, from a UN perspective, and this is really to try and protect the idea of a global public good, but find a balance between public and private interests, between individual and community, um, and that's now seen as a as an issue. And for me, in the next couple of years, I really hope we we can bring that to fruition, and that the UN can either publish a, a data convention or a data compact that will set out the the kind of broad global principles of how we should be thinking about data uh, to try and balance all the competing needs, um, as I said, between public and private, between individual and community. And I think that will be a really, really important um, piece of work. Thank you so much, um, Steve, for those insights, both from the broader view of, of the world at large and the institutional view of the WHO and within the UN system. Um, we are now a little bit over time. Um, but I'd just like to say thank you so much to, to our three panelists today. I think it's been a really, really um, exciting and interesting conversation to have. Um, you know, we've been talking about many of these issues for, for, for months now, um, but I do think we've, we've reached a stage in the pandemic and in the maturity of the pandemic where, where we can start to talk about the future a bit more concretely and to think about the lessons learned from that pandemic as we start to navigate this new normal. Um, there are a couple of questions from the audience which remain unanswered, and I do apologize for that. Um, I've tried to balance out um, uh, the questions from the audience and, and, and provoking conversation within, within uh, the panelists and discussants themselves. So I do apologize um, that we haven't been able to answer all questions. Please feel free to drop them in the chat as open questions and perhaps they can be they can be raised within the breakout sessions. Speaking of which, um, we're now going to be moving into those breakout sessions. Um, there are going to be three breakout sessions. The first will be exploring issues around African data protection regulation and best practices and what we've learned from the pandemic. The second will be um, uh, exploring issues around what it takes to have a successful data partnership in Africa um, uh, following the pandemic and what some of the lessons learned have been, um, both from the partnership between ECN and GPSCD and more broadly. Um, and the third will be exploring issues um, relating to citizen and youth engagement in digital issues and what we need to make sure that the next generation has the digital literacy skills um, to push for, for higher standards of data governance. So I'll, I'll hand over to Al here to just say a couple of words in introduction to that and perhaps explain how that's going to work technically. Um, but for me, thank you very, very much, uh, Claire, Steve, and, um, and Oliver for your, for your contributions there. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Tom, and that really was a great uh, um, uh, conversation. We're going to be joining the breakout session um, right now. Um, I'm sure you can see on your screen an invitation to join a breakout, so get ready to just uh, jump in there and let's continue the conversations. Kenya began in 2013 with the aim of bringing services closer to the citizens. This was a milestone in the right direction as we have often believed that real change happens where data and development meets real people. We believe that sustainable development can best be achieved at sub-national level, 
village by village, county by county, province by province. Governments also have a mandate to provide services and equitably allocate resources to their communities. What we have found through our work is that data is crucial to this end. For the government to deliver services, they must have numbers. For them to have numbers, they must engage citizens. We take the leave no one behind mantra seriously. This has greatly fueled the work that we do to find and give voice to people who are left behind using data for improved advocacy and agency. These include artisanal small-scale miners who eke out a living working without safety gear or equipment and often getting raw deals for their precious metals and stones that they mine. We aim to make every ASM be counted and their needs and prioritized amplified into action by government and other stakeholders. Persons with disabilities are often left out, especially in as far as accessibility is concerned. We have asked ourselves, could a person with disability come from one end of town to another independently and with dignity? What are the things that must happen to enable them? These thoughts inspired the Ability Project that mapped out every street in Nairobi and several other towns. Those maps are used as tools for advocacy. We have been privileged to work with county governments, collaborating with them to collect, analyze and build the capacity of their data offices. Through our Open County program, we have worked with several counties to promote open government at the grassroots. Most recently, we have engaged 10 data leaders county chief officers who have been part of our Data Leaders Fellowship program. We have been working with these data fellows to strengthen their county's data value chains with the goal of setting up county statistical units to manage county data. At the heart of our work is our collaboration with various partners and experts, from our fellow CSOs to development partners and governments. We keep working together to realize a dream of a prosperous continent with continuous improved livelihoods for their citizens and that sustains its own development. Devolution in Kenya began in 2013 with the aim of bringing services closer to the citizens. This was a milestone in the right direction as we have often believed that real change happens where data and development meets real people. We believe that sustainable development can best be achieved at sub-national level, village by village, county by county, province by province. Governments also have a mandate to provide services and equitably allocate resources to their communities. What we have found through our work is that data is crucial to this end. For the government to deliver services, they must have numbers. For them to have numbers, they must engage citizens. We take the leave no one behind mantra seriously. This has greatly fueled the work that we do to find and give voice to people who are left behind using data for improved advocacy and agency. These include artisanal small-scale miners who eke out a living working without safety gear or equipment and often getting raw deals for their precious metals and stones that they mine. We aim to make every ASM be counted and their needs and prioritized amplified into action by government and other stakeholders. Persons with disabilities are often left out, especially in as far as accessibility is concerned. We have asked ourselves, could a person with disability come from one end of town to another independently and with dignity? What are the things that must happen to enable them? 
These thoughts inspired the Ability Project that mapped out every street in Nairobi and several other towns. Those maps are used as tools for advocacy. We have been privileged to work with county governments, collaborating with them to collect, analyze and build the capacity of their data offices. Through our Open County program, we have worked with several counties to promote open government at the grassroots. Most recently, we have engaged 10 data leaders, county chief officers, who have been part of our Data Leaders Fellowship program. We have been working with these data fellows to strengthen their county's data value chains with the goal of setting up county statistical units to manage county data. At the heart of our work is our collaboration with various partners and experts, from our fellow CSOs to development partners and governments. We keep working together to realize a dream of a prosperous continent with continuous improved livelihoods for their citizens and that sustains its own development. The evolution in Kenya began in 2013 with the aim of bringing services closer to the citizens. This was a milestone in the right direction as we have often believed that real change happens where data and development meets real people. We believe that sustainable development can best be achieved at sub-national level, village by village, county by county, province by province. Governments also have a mandate to provide services and equitably allocate resources to their communities. What we have found through our work is that data is crucial to this end. For the government to deliver services, they must have numbers. For them to have numbers, they must engage citizens. We take the leave no one behind mantra seriously. This has greatly fueled the work that we do to find and give voice to people who are left behind using data for improved advocacy and agency. These include artisanal small-scale miners who eke out a living working without safety gear or equipment and often getting raw deals for their precious metals and stones that they mine. We aim to make every ASM be counted and their needs and prioritized amplified into action by government and other stakeholders. Persons with disabilities are often left out, especially in as far as accessibility is concerned. We have asked ourselves, could a person with disability come from one end of town to another independently and with dignity? What are the things that must happen to enable them? These thoughts inspired the Ability Project that mapped out every street in Nairobi and several other towns. Those maps are used as tools for advocacy. We have been privileged to work with county governments, collaborating with them to collect, analyze and build the capacity of their data offices. Through our Open County program, we have worked with several counties to promote open government at the grassroots. Most recently, we have engaged 10 data leaders county chief officers who have been part of our Data Leaders Fellowship program. We have been working with these data fellows to strengthen their county's data value chains with the goal of setting up county statistical units to manage county data. At the heart of our work is our collaboration with various partners and experts, from our fellow CSOs to development partners and governments. We keep working together to realize a dream of a prosperous continent with continuous improved livelihoods for their citizens and that sustains its own development.
Devolution in Kenya began in 2013 with the aim of bringing services closer to the citizens. This was a milestone in the right direction as we have often believed that real change happens where data and development meets real people. We believe that sustainable development can best be achieved at sub-national level, village by village, county by county, province by province. Governments also have a mandate to provide services and equitably allocate resources to their communities. What we have found through our work is that data is crucial to this end. For the government to deliver services, they must have numbers. For them to have numbers, they must engage citizens. We take the leave no one behind mantra seriously. This has greatly fueled the work that we do to find and give voice to people who are left behind using data for improved advocacy and agency. These include artisanal small-scale miners who eck out a living working without safety gear or equipment and often getting raw deals for their precious metals and stones that they mine. We aim to make every ASM be counted and their needs and prioritized amplified into action by government and other stakeholders. Persons with disabilities are often left out, especially in as far as accessibility is concerned. We have asked ourselves, could a person with disability come from one end of town to another independently and with dignity? What are the things that must happen to enable them? These thoughts inspired the ability project that mapped out every street in Nairobi and several other towns. Those maps are used as tools for advocacy. We have been privileged to work with county governments, collaborating with them to collect, analyze and build the capacity of their data offices. Through our Open County program, we have worked with several counties to promote open government at the grassroots. Most recently, we have engaged 10 data leaders, county chief officers, who have been part of our Data Leaders Fellowship program. We have been working with these data fellows to strengthen their county's data value chains with the goal of setting up county statistical units to manage county data. At the heart of our work is our collaboration with various partners and experts, from our fellow CSOs to development partners and governments. We keep working together to realize a dream of a prosperous continent with continuous improved livelihoods for their citizens and that sustains its own development. Thank you so much. I think um, I think literally everybody has has come back um, from the breakout sessions, and I hope that the breakout sessions that you are having were as as fruitful and as happy as as mine was. Um, we, we we had uh, a great conversation about um, some of the lessons that um, we must learn, and I'm going to literally just mention two lessons that we picked up during our breakout session. Um, one of which is that all data is local, and we must um, build systems to allow for um, data to be harnessed at, at local level. Um, and I think one of the other big lessons that we we ended up with um, just before we closed is that we, we have to um, applaud work like what the data, uh, the global data barometer does um, to track um, uh, the value of data and also the value of how data is managed, but also the, the need for literacy, not just at a citizen level, but also at legislate, uh, legislator and, and central government level. Um, I'm going to invite Tom. Um, I think Tom was talking um, to, um, uh, the issues around youth um, to just give us a, a general highlight of of, uh, of of what you talked about um, in your group uh, before we, we, we go forward. 
Thanks, Al, and thank you very much to everyone who took part in the in the group um, discussing youth and citizen engagement and digital literacy. Um, there were there were two or three points that were made, which I think are, are really important for us to keep in mind moving forward. Um, the first is that one of the lessons from the COVID pandemic um, is that social media accounts and social media platforms can actually be very positive tools, um, especially in engaging youth. Um, on specific things. So the, the examples were given um, of, uh, you know, young people utilizing TikToks um, to create videos and to create content um, about how to sanitize your hands, how to put a mask on, um, and basically conveying those, pub those crucial public health messages through social media platforms and in ways in which young people um, would be more responsive to. So that was one of the points that was made, which, which I thought was actually important for us to think about moving forward in, in terms of how we can better utilize those kinds of platforms in an organic way. Um, second, the second point I think that was that was important, and this is kind of my reflection on, on a couple of, of different points that were made and, and just trying to synthesize that and, and make sense of it in my mind, but that, that digital literacy works differently for different audiences and at different levels. And I'll, I'll break that down a bit. So if we think about the work that Jackie does and that, that she shared with us at the beginning um, of, of this uh, Buntwani, um, we're starting literally at, at, at the very basics, um, how to use a mobile phone, how to type uh, on a computer, uh, um, what the history of, of communication has been and helping people to, to situate themselves in, in the digital era and to understand the power of these tools. And then that's kind of the, the fundamental basis upon which the rest of digital literacy happens. But I think, you know, I was also reminded of the fact that, that digital literacy skills are also outdated at other levels. And, and Steve from the WHO um, spoke a bit to, to the work that he does um, internationally to help improve statistical literacy um, and commented upon the ways in which statistics are still taught as very mathematical um, and theoretical concepts rather than being grounded in human experience and and um, and seen as something that that supplement uh, you know how we view society and how we how we contextualize ourselves as, as human beings within the world and I think that's a really important point because many of the Many of the issues of governance and to understand data governance, you have to understand that data and figures um, are not just these mathematical truths, but are something which are made by people and are fallible, just like people are. So I think that there's that side to data literacy that we also mustn't forget. Finally, the third, the third reflection, um, and again, this is something that's often spoken about but, but trying to think about it a little bit further was a point made by Mark about how technocrats and how bureaucrats within government and within institutions communicate data. Um, and we hear, at least in my circles, we hear about this quite often about improving how data are communicated, et cetera. Um, but there is something very fundamental here in, in making sure that we empower people with the right skills um, to be able to communicate data effectively for their local context. And right skills doesn't necessarily mean being able to interpret a map or being able to visualize data in a way, but it means being able to, to explain why information is important to a particular community in a particular way. And I think that this is where work like that of, of the Open Institute and others is actually really important because it's not just about the skills and you know, can you visualize this data? Can you portray it this way? But it's about conveying why that data is important, why its meaning is important for local communities. So I think those are some of the, the, uh, the important issues that we discussed um, in, in our group. Thank you. Back to you, Al. Excellent. And can I invite Davis to also just come and tell us a little bit about the things that they talked about in their group. Hello, Alcags. Um, hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me clearly. 
Uh, my name is uh, Davis Adeno. I'm the Director of Programs at the Global Partnership for Sustainable Development Data. And we had um, a quite intimate uh, discussion around uh, the lessons learned about successful data partnerships in Africa uh, during the pandemic and uh, what possibly could be done to strengthen inclusion, participation uh, of marginalized groups, uh, but also beyond marginalized groups, looking at citizens um, as, as key constituencies um, and issues around transparency and accountability. Um, I don't know how long I have, but I'll just very quickly summarize um, that the first issue that emerged was um, that whereas we had um, lots of partnerships going on and uh, significant demand for partnerships, um, you know, matching demand and supply was still a challenge uh, in the sense that um, whereas some of the data resources were being made available, you know, either analytics, um, um, uh, you know, platforms or whatever it is, uh, integrating this into existing mechanisms and systems was quite a challenge, uh, a big challenge, um, and it still is. Um, and, and so that's one of the things that, that, that really stood out. Um, and in some instances, it did take quite a long time uh, for governments to appreciate. Uh, but there, also, there was also a major opportunity in terms of uh, the glass ceiling being broken. Um, conversations that had been happening for the past several years suddenly coming to bear and governments and private sector companies and civil society organizations suddenly seeing an opportunity for them to come to the table and really work together uh, to deliver um, you know, the, the response that was needed by different governments and, and partners across, across the region. Um, and so, you know, and, and one of the elements that came out of that particular conversation was it's important to think about existing systems, um, existing processes, um, and existing workflow processes that you know you can then almost seamlessly integrate to, um, uh, rather than thinking about this as something new that's coming into countries um, or into into particular um, uh, existing uh, existing initiatives. So taking a purpose-driven approach uh, and being conscious about uh, some of these issues uh, was was quite uh, was quite uh, uh, critical. Second was uh, also related, uh, but is around reusing and mobilizing, um, you know, existing resources, especially at the national level, uh, looking at um, identifying different stakeholders who may have different perspectives, yes, uh, but um, create the necessary framework that then connects uh, those who actually have and those who don't have. Uh, and in between, uh, thinking about what are the governance mechanisms that need to be in place uh, to govern that particular relationship. And I think when we talk about policy and regulations and the amazing work that, you know, Open Institute and Data Ready have been doing, um, you know, around policy and regulatory uh, frameworks uh, and safeguarding uh, uh, privacy, you know, there has to be a framework in place that then ensures that there is transparency and accountability. And we had that in the absence of that, then it's very difficult to hold uh, anyone to account. Um, and so as, as a major step, we need to see policy and regulatory frameworks um, that you know, include all these conversations that we've been having today and of course uh, over the last couple of days uh, being integrated in a very proactive uh, manner to respond to the challenges of today and the challenges of now, but also anticipating, uh, anticipating the, the, the future. Um, we also heard about uh, the opportunity in terms of private sector companies uh, being willing, uh, you know, coming up and being more willing to participate um, both in contributing data, but also aggregating and validating uh, some, some, of, uh, some, of, some of their data um, in certain areas that were critical. Uh, we heard, for example, from Development Gateway uh, around the political nature of fertilizers uh, across the region, across the region in Africa. Uh, but in the case of Ghana, for example, you know, private sector proactively came out uh, and they were keen to engage uh, and participate, um, you know, in, in, in issues around, um, you know, subsidy volumes. Um, and of course, uh, uh, you know, we also learned that the very political nature of these conversations means that naturally governments want to lock out citizens uh, and other stakeholders. And so there's a huge challenge there, um, which means that 
um, you know, opportunities for citizen participation to be integrated like we had in Kenya um, in some of the subnational uh, legal frameworks creates, uh, a, you know, an enabling environment for them to uh, to to actually um, uh, to actually participate, um, and maybe lastly, um, we had that whereas we've had impactful projects and pilots. Um, if there's anything we learned out of the COVID uh, pandemic response, is that we have a long way to go, given the way we all all of us uh, governments, civil society, private sector, everybody scrambled. Uh, to try and mobilize to respond to the issue, which means that we are not we are not yet there, we are not ready, uh, and and therefore this is a great opportunity to reflect on what has been existing, what is being done right now, uh, but have an eye for the future uh, and think actively. What do we do best? Uh, what are some of the lessons that we've learned that can then help us to accelerate uh, progress uh, and and put in place mechanisms that then uh, allow not only meaningful partnerships to exist. Uh, bring in citizen voices, uh, bring in private sector voices, uh, but also think about, you know, um, into the future, what are the critical issues that need more resourcing, that need more uh, emphasis and need to be integrated um, in a more sustainable way uh, in policy and regulatory frameworks to safeguard against um, a rollback of some of the progress that uh, we've actually met. I'll pause there. Um, and. Uh, you know, leave it to any of my colleagues um, who were in the breakout session uh, to contribute if there's something I've missed out. Thank you. I'm very grateful for that, um, Davis. In fact, that was very um, comprehensive uh, um, feedback. I can see from the time that we are just about out of time. Um, and I, you know, first of all, I want to say how grateful I am that um, all of us have participated. This is such an important uh, conversation for us. And this is why when we had to try and figure out the top three things that um, we can discuss at this first virtual Buntwani, we've had multiple Buntwani's before, but this is our very first virtual one. And we're hoping that the next one is going to be a physical one where we will actually sit around um, a circle as we have done in the past. Um, but when we were trying to figure out which, which are the three top conversations, Data, the question of data governance is one that we think is, is still flagship. Uh, Tom and I started a, um, a quest um, about a year ago where we were trying to think about how um, it can be possible for us um, as, as a continent and as a planet for us to um, restore data rights. So we knew that a lot of people's personal um, data was, was um, not necessarily being handled in the best way possible by governments and by private sector. Um, but now that we know that, um, you know, we're we are talking about a new normal and we're not necessarily talking about, um, you know, a post pandemic um, situation, the question is still um, ever more relevant now that uh, at what point do we say that now we must restore people's data rights, that now governments must build policy that ensures that um, people's data rights are respected, um, that now it is, you know, that from this point onwards, it is not uh, correct for you to use my GPS data to track my contacts, for example, and, and, and those sort of things. And that what are the new parameters for um, managing our, our data? This is a conversation that I think, um, I, if I speak for the Open Institute and for Tom as well, um, at Data Ready and his team, I know that this is a, a, a conversation that is extremely relevant um, at this point and still very valuable for us to push. Um, we have worked very closely with many of you that are here and some that are not um, to try and push forward this conversation um, as much as possible. And I'm really grateful to, to all of you. Um, and please, I, I want to basically ask that as this conversation continues and as we continue looking for you um, so that we can be able to educate our legislative um, uh, colleagues as we educate our colleagues in, um, in um, central government, because they all are going to need some level of literacy. They're going to be able to uh, be um, as strong believers as we are about this issue, um, that you will make yourself available because those are things that we are going to be uh, doing. So before we close, I'm just going to invite Tom, um, you know, my partner in crime, 
to um, very quickly say um, something um, in closing um, before we, we, we wrap it up. Thanks so much, Al. And there isn't really much more to say. Um, it, it's always hard to follow you. I just want to say thank you very much to absolutely everyone for joining today. Um, I'm going to give you back 10 minutes of your time and your day. It's, it's been a very long session. Um, but I do just want to thank the team at the Open Institute for putting on an incredible three-day event under very difficult circumstances. Um, and to pay tribute as well to the to their colleague Jonah who passed away at around this time last year and just to recognize how difficult it's been for that team to, to pull together and to, to publish the work that he finished and to move forward with this Buntwani. And I think it's a reflection that we've all lost people and it's been an incredibly difficult couple of years for everyone. And as we, we, as we start, to rebuild so, you know these are issues in the new normal which are going to be live and I very much look forward to continuing the conversation in terms of the specific outcomes from today um, we will be putting together a report in the next few weeks um, everything moves a bit slower because of the pandemic so do bear with us but we will be putting together a report in the next few weeks that pulls together some of the insights from this conversation, together with responses that we've had to a survey, which Ivy has just dropped in the chat. Please do take a look and take it if you have the time. Um, and which we hope will set out some of the recommendations that we have um, for, for what the restoration of data rights looks like um, following the COVID experience. Thank you so much much everyone and a very equally important stay safe stay healthy uh, and look after yourselves thank you so much and we particularly want to say thank you to um tom because tom took um these 30 hours um out of his holiday um to come and be with us today um and make sure that he's uh, participating and to jay and the rest of the open institute team that has been working behind the scenes thank you so much um, thank you, everyone, for coming, and um, we're happy to have finished um, nine minutes before uh, time so that we can give you some of that time back into your day. We wish you well um, for the rest of the period. Asante sana, and goodbye.